our next speaker to uh, share with us reflections on the same topic, new forms of leadership and governance in the church in a synodal way, is Bishop Pablo Virgilio David. He told us on the first day that he likes to be called and that he is normally called Bishop Embo. Bishop Embo is a bishop of the Diocese of Caloocan and is the president of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines. Bishop Embo, kindly share your reflections. It would be nice if you could finish Hello. in 20 minutes, I know. <laughs> I hope you don't mind that I recorded my talk because I tend to make too many parenthetical remarks in between, so that will just, you know, please watch it. Dear brother bishops and fellow servant leaders in the Church of Asia, dear brothers and sisters in this FABC 50 conference, good afternoon. I have been requested to address you on the topic, Synodality, Leadership and Governance, New Pathways for the Church in Asia. You would remember that last Tuesday, Cardinal Jose Advincula of Manila referred to the first council ever to be convened by the church. And that was the Council of Jerusalem that was held in 50 AD. The church in Jerusalem, headed by the apostles, was functioning then as the central authority. What occasioned that first council was the fact that uh, some people in the Jerusalem leadership were feeling that their authority was being undermined by the church at Antioch on account of the new pathways that their missionaries were taking. Specifically, it had to do with Paul, whose aggressive missionary activities among the Gentiles was causing some negative reactions among the Jewish Christians. Instead of just ignoring the reactions, Paul made it a point to reach out to the central leadership body in Jerusalem to seek their counsel while sharing to them about the new pathways which he was convinced the Holy Spirit was leading the church to, namely the opening of the doors to the Gentile converts to the Christian faith. And St. Luke, whose feast we celebrated last Tuesday, tells us about this in Acts chapter 14, verse 27. If you follow the text very closely, the opposite personalities on the issue were not really Paul and Peter, but rather Paul and James. Not James, the son of Zebedee, but the other James, otherwise known as the brother or the relative of the Lord. This is the James that Paul himself speaks about in Galatians chapter 2, verse 12, who had presumably sent a team of Judaizers to spy on what the church at Antioch was up to. I am therefore wondering why we have gotten so used to referring to Peter as apostle to the Jews and Paul as apostle to the Gentiles. Well, understandably, that comes from St. Paul himself, Galatians chapter 2, verse 7. And that was, of course, before the council was resolved or the council resolved the issue when Paul still tended to caricature the Jerusalem church as limiting the mission to the Jews. In fact, all of them, including Paul himself, began as a puzzle to the Jews. Even Paul tells us how their initial evangelizing missions were directed mainly to their fellow Jews who gathered for the Sabbath in the synagogues, whether in the homeland or in the diaspora. But it was Paul who dared to shift his attention to the Gentiles, who gathered in the outer courtyards of the synagogues, the one called proselytes in Greek, when the insiders, meaning the mainstream Jews, rejected them. It was the Gentile outsiders who apparently expressed greater interest in their message. But St. Luke tells us Peter himself had also begun to show interest in the Gentiles, as narrated in Acts chapter 10. Remember the story of Cornelius on account of a message that Peter had received through a vision? Among the apostles, 
it was the other James, the one called the relative of the Lord who seemed to have actually insisted on keeping their evangelizing mission focused on their fellow Jews. I imagine him probably quoting Jesus, reminding them to go mainly to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And so James was not that keen on Paul's idea of welcoming the Gentile converts to Christianity without first circumcising or Judaizing them. It was in such a tense situation of conflict with regard to the mission that Peter first assumed his role of leadership in the apostolic community. Instead of siding with one or the other, he stood between James and Paul, and he made the move to keep them together by serving as facilitator of dialogue right there at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. He also kept the communion between Jerusalem and Antioch. You know, if the secular journalists uh, had already lived back then or in those times, and if they were to report on the Council of Jerusalem, you know, they would probably have labeled James as representing the conservatives or traditionalists and Paul as representing the progressives or the liberals in the early church. You know? Well, Luke tells us it was Peter who consistently played the role of the bridge builder, the promoter of communion. No wonder we refer to the office of Peter as Pontifex Maximus, which literally means the supreme bridge builder or the supreme pontiff or the greatest bridge builder. In the church, whether local or universal, it is never a choice between one or the other. Part of the wisdom of the church is precisely its gift of being able to keep together the traditionalist and the renewalist, to rise above the labels and to call them all her children. There will never be a time when we will give up on the need to keep the church anchored on tradition and scripture, just as there will never be a time when we will give up on the principle of Ecclesia Semper Reformanda, a church constantly renewing herself in response to the signs of the times. And so, while Pope John XXIII called on the Council Fathers to an aggiornamento, or updating or renewal, he at the same time made sure that it was done simultaneously with what the French would call ressourcement or a healthy return to the sources or an anchoring on the apostolic tradition. Well, Pope Francis is not any different. Like Peter who respected the missionary dynamics of the local church at Antioch, even as he played the role of keeping them together in communion with the mother church, which back then was not yet Rome, but Jerusalem, Pope Francis has also consistently balanced the functioning of the central or universal church authority in Rome with that of the local conferences and the synods of bishops. How often, how often have we heard Pope Francis say that he wants to see a greater decentralization of some curia functions and a greater participation of the conferences of bishops in the roles of leadership and governance. And haven't we heard him say very often, unity does not have to mean uniformity. Let me point out one very concrete example to further illustrate my point. We all know that Vatican II's dogmatic constitution on liturgy, the Sacrosanctum Concilium, called for, let me quote, a fully conscious and active participation of the faithful in the liturgical celebrations of the church. One of the most important expressions of this principle has been the move to adopt the use of vernacular languages for liturgical celebrations. And yet, already 
time Vatican II was convened, most of the dioceses in our own countries and in various parts of Asia are still using unofficial, meaning ad experimentum vernacular translations of the Roman Missal and other liturgical rites. So far, only a few of our own major language groups in the Philippines have succeeded in getting our liturgical texts approved by the congregation now called the Dicastery for the Divine Worship in Rome. When we all know how quickly languages evolve, don't we? And how by the time a proposed translation is approved, it would have become archaic already. In September 2017, to give the issue of approving translations of liturgical texts a more immediate action, Pope Francis issued the document Manium Principium, modifying Canon 838 of the Canon Law. The document opens with a statement, and let me quote directly, the great principle established by the Second Vatican Council, according to which liturgical prayer be accommodated to the comprehension of the people so that it might be understood, required the weighty task of introducing the vernacular language into the liturgy and of preparing and approving the versions of the liturgical books, a charge that was entrusted to the bishops, he says. Well, he's talking about the great principle, and we thought this great principle that Pope Francis is speaking about had already been adequately addressed in the aftermath of the Council. Yes, indeed it was. But as usual, you can have dogmatic constitutions that will lay down the fundamental principles of the reforms being adopted, but without any clear implementing rules or regulations that they would call them nowadays, IRRs, they will just remain in paper and will not achieve the reform that had been originally approved by the Council. When the task is assumed mainly by the Roman Curia offices done by the local conferences and synods of bishops, the result is very easy to predict. You know, His Eminence Cardinal Lazaro of the Congregation or the Dicastery for the Clergy made us all laugh yesterday when he quoted Pope Francis saying, historians tell us it takes at least 100 years for a council to take effect, to really take effect. Well, Pope Francis says, we're halfway there already. And he, I believe he was humoring the people he was addressing. The most important principles that have been embraced by Vatican II in relation to leadership and governance in the church are encapsulated in two words, collegiality and subsidiarity. Collegiality, on the one hand, is the principle by which authority is practiced in the spirit of communio among the office holders in the church on many levels in the national and continental conferences of bishops, as well as in the general synod of bishops in Rome. Well, lately, Pope Francis has also reminded the bishops that the spirit of synodality should not just be among bishops or the ordained leaders of the church. If synodality has to do with promoting a greater communion, participation, and mission in the church, then bishops should make sure that we are able to get the census fidei fidelium through synodal consultations and opportunities for communal discernment that would also involve the rest of the faithful, the laity, religious, and the clergy included, as well as other sectors of society that impact the life and mission of the church. And so the coming continental synod uh, will have to be more than just the FABC. Subsidiarity, on the other hand, is the principle by which collegial authority is divided up into layers and decisions are made at the appropriate levels. 
it's work, uh, sorry, it works in exactly the same way in our particular churches as it does in the universal church. The principle is basically the same. Leadership is best exercised in a team, in a ministerial college. What the subsidiary units can do best and are in a position to decide for themselves, the higher units must respect. It is basically the concept of shared authority and participatory leadership. The kind of leadership that enhances, not undermines communion. So collegiality and subsidiarity are actually the antithesis to the institutional church's tendency to function like an absolute monarchy with an over-centralized system of governance. And, well, expectedly, this is bound to happen when the Roman Curia is structured in such a way that it is more conscious of its political function of governance as a state than its pastoral function of serving the communion of the universal church. It is what happens when ecclesiastical authority is not properly grounded on the church's pastoral and ecclesial dynamics. The modus vivendi et operandi of the church on the universal level will tend to replicate itself in the local church levels. It will reflect itself in the way we bishops, we ourselves, govern our own dioceses. We can run them also like a mini Vatican state with a functioning bureaucracy that, this, that tends to prescribe rather than recommend a common template for all the parishes. Among the most common consequences of such a style of governance is uh, the stifling of creativity and the hindering of a greater efficiency and effectiveness in the operations of the subsidiary entities of our dioceses, like the vicariates, the parishes, the mission stations, and the basic ecclesial communities. Do we not all have our own diocesan curia offices that sometimes also tend to overdo their authority over the parishes and do so in the name of the bishop? I like to believe that it was with this in mind that Pope Francis convened his Council of Cardinals in 2016 in order to consult them as to what might be the most important issue in the reform of the Roman Curia, namely the healthy decentralization of decision-making in the Church in a manner that promotes the conciliar principles of collegiality and subsidiarity. Dear brother bishops, we are convening this FABC conference at a very auspicious time in the, church, in, in the church's history when Pope Francis is pursuing a kind of a reigniting of the fire of Vatican II. You know, in my country, the Philippines, we have a kind of rice cake that we call bibingka. And this rice cake is baked in an earthen pot that is fired up with burning charcoal above the clay pot and below the clay pot. Pope Francis seems to be cooking up his reform in the same way, with fire above and fire below. By fire above, I am alluding to the Vatican Curia reform, which I've earlier mentioned about. It was the topic discussed earlier by Monsignor Joseph Sayer, the New Apostolic Constitution Predicate Evangelium, recently put together and published to replace the old one, Pastor Bonus, by Pope John Paul II. Now, the fire below, through the Synod on Synodality, which began with a consultation from the lowest level on the local churches, of the local churches around the world. We expect this process which has progressed from below, from the parish to the diocesan, to the national, to the continental, and the global levels. We will have to decide yet when between January and March of 2023, we will be holding our own continental synod for Asia. 
The other day, a letter was sent by the Synod General Secretariat announcing that the Global Synod will happen in two sessions. Well, one session will happen in October 2023 and a second session in October of 2024. And, you know, that means that we may have to wait until early 2025 before we can have these, the fruits of the Synod properly articulated in an apostolic exhortation that will take the census fidei, fidelium, very seriously. I think you will agree with me if I say synodality has consistently been Pope Francis's main platform of papacy. He has named its three important interrelated components as communion, participation, and mission. I am inclined to call it a revisitation or a refresher on Vatican II. After all, synodality is really just another term for conciliarity in reference to Vatican II. Concilium is just the Latin version for the Greek term synodos. Well, we take it for granted that since Vatican II was an ecumenical council and its dogmatic constitutions and decrees had been approved in the spirit of synodality, the succeeding pontiffs were duty-bound to pursue the implementation of its key resolutions that are most reflective of its aspirations for an ecclesia, semper reformanda. It was not always the case, of course. The reason for this well, had to do precisely with the dual dynamics within the central operations of Rome. First, as a political state run by a bureaucracy uh, on the one hand, and a central expression of the universal church's communio, one that respects the primacy of the, uh, the, the, primacy of the bishop of Rome, who presides in pastoral charity over all the churches around the world, on the other hand. The dynamic tension between these two is what I think Pope Francis has tried to address in Predicate Evangelium. Basically, to make sure that the Roman Curia gets to function in a manner that is also respectful of the conciliar principles of collegiality and subsidiarity. Perhaps FADC can discuss more exhaustively the areas of concern that in our common or communal discernment are best left to the subsidiary leadership of national conferences of bishops and their continental federations. Now, would these include, you know, such concerns as, say, a more meaningful participation in the nomination, election, coordination, and disciplining of bishops? the possibilities can be explored and a dialogue uh, we can engage each other in a dialogue about these possibilities well suffice it to say that these are being gradually brought to light by the holy spirit through the interplay of both the dynamics of adjournment on the one hand and resource on the other hand that guided the second vatican council did not the Council of Jerusalem uphold the decision of the Church of Antioch to do mission work to the Gentiles and allow Gentile converts to be baptized without requiring them to undergo circumcision or what we might call a Judaization? In short, what the Church of Antioch and their presbyters could decide for themselves, the central authority in Jerusalem did not have to impede because they were also following the, the promptings of the same Holy Spirit. They only provided some guidelines that would help the Gentile Christian converts to behave with pastoral charity towards their Jewish Christian brethren, like avoiding such conduct that would scandalize them or offend their sensibilities. I therefore hear Peter's voice of sobriety in the voice of Pope Francis, who strengthens communion within the Catholic Church by strengthening the conferences of bishops in their collegial exercise of authority 
from the national to the continental to the global levels. To the overzealous advocates of centralized governance who fear that promoting participatory decision-making among the bishops might compromise the unity of the church, well, I hear a petrine voice that assures them that this move towards greater synodality, both ad intra and ad extra, is the better path. The better path towards the universal church's growth in communion, participation, and mission. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bishop David, for this enlightening, thought-provoking reflection on how we can promote new forms of leadership and governance in the church in a synodal spirit at different levels. Shall we pause for a few moments of prayerful silence? Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit.